Hoff, and I don't think I've ever known your first name. <laughs> I, I haven't seen you since first grade, but I, I was, it's so funny because I was just thinking about saying to you all, um, first of all, of course, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here, and I really respect you, the work that you all have done. I'm blown away by it. Really wonderful speeches already so far. So I first want to say thank you. and. Just am here to learn, listen and learn and pay respects to those who've been on the front lines and those deeply affected, and then by what's happening and and you're resisting, you're opposing, but you're really creating something new in such a beautiful way, and and it's I can feel it, and the energy and excitement is wonderful. The second thing I was going to say is about Virginia, and I was just thinking, you know. I am, my family's from Tennessee, as, as, as most people know, most of my family is from Tennessee, or my, but that's actually the patrilineal line. Um, my matrilineal line is Virginia. And um, not only that, I, um, well, when my father was elected to, to the House of Representatives in 1976, uh, I was three years old and we were in, um, in I was born in Nashville and all that. Uh, and we were in Tennessee, but we moved into the home in Arlington, Virginia that my mother had grown up in, that her mother had grown up in, that her grandfather built when he came from Sweden. His family immigrated from Sweden. And I went to Oak Ridge Elementary School from kindergarten through, through sixth grade. And I was just thinking to myself, oh, I should, I maybe I'll have a chance to mention that to them that I went to Oak Ridge Elementary School and I was thinking about what I learned there from kindergarten to sixth grade. And then all of a sudden, someone taps on my shoulder. <laughs> I just, it's just really special for me. Thank you very much. But, but what I wanted to, to say about that is that um, we said the Pledge of Allegiance. That's the first uh, place that I learned about the founding of this country, um, about our system of government, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the separation of powers. And to be here in Virginia, Reconnecting to my 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 matrilineal line, and I stayed in that house last night. My brother lives there. He lives there now, um, in the same home that I grew up in. And so, um, it really feels right now in this moment when something has clearly gone uh, awry in our country in terms of the conflicting narratives about who we are as a people, um, the confusion about the the basic principles and values that this country is is based on, um, that it was reminding me of uh, James Baldwin's uh, statement that we, we all should do our first works over. And I think that we're at a time in this country where we need to do our first works over and uh, know from whence we came. And thinking about the Virginian uh, who wrote that we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Water is life. Air is life. These are inalienable rights. Those words don't belong alone to Thomas Jefferson because we know in this country that they also belong to the people like Martin Luther King, like Mother Jones, like so many who have taken those words and made them come alive and made this country what it is, Eleanor Roosevelt, Frederick Douglass. There are so many who have hearkened back to those original words written and actually made them full of meaning. And I do think that we're at a time now where we have to look and see what, what, do we, what, what are our inalienable rights. And in Virginia, which is of any state you could pick, the one that it has been a, where a fault line is, and you can go down Jefferson Davis Highway and be looking towards the, the Lincoln and, and the Washington Memorial, you can um, see it in many different ways. We saw it in Charlottesville. Um, we've seen it in the courageous act actions that are taking place in, in the meetings that you all have described where you're speaking up and, uh, and the citizenship that, that is involved in that. So to be in Virginia at this time uh, is very special to me. Also to be in a church, because where my life path took me was to Union Theological Seminary, and 
I uh, wound up there to in a job that was a more general job. I didn't intend to go straight into climate change work, by the way. <laughs> um, and that was something that it's true. My, my, my father had, has a fairly high profile in that area, and I respect his work. But it, the way I got into this, I, like so many people, I think um, it's, it's obviously such a compelling situation. There are so many ways to engage that I think I'm one of many that has found that way for me. And it happened to be when I was at Union, and uh, it was September 2014, and the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called the Climate Summit uh, because Paris was coming up, everyone had been so disappointed in, about Copenhagen, and there was this feeling like governments couldn't do this, the world governments couldn't get together to get an agreement, and civil society had to be engaged more deeply in order to deal with the problem of climate change. And that the science and the economics um, are not enough. And civil society, of course, means a lot of different sectors, businesses and arts and so on, but it also means religion. And I was at a seminary, so we, uh, con we were able to convene a big conference there called Religions for the Earth. And we had almost 300 religious and spiritual leaders come from around the world to reframe climate change as a moral issue and galvanize faith-based activism about it. And that gave us the opportunity to really look at belief systems, um, to look at deep root causes. And I just, I don't want to go on too long here, but I do want, I, I wanted to mention a couple of, of those root causes that I remember jumping out to me. Um, one is really basic. It's just this kind of false impression that so many of us uh, grew up around that humanity is separate from nature. <laughs> so um, you can, look at different faith traditions for where that might come from. And obviously in this country, uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition has been dominant. And it's been interesting uh, to look at the scholars who've gone back at the biblical language. And I don't know if it's a coincidence, but it often centers around the word dominion. <laughs> um, I'm sure you all have touched on this before uh, in this in this situation. Um, but the thing that I find interesting about that, um, of course, uh, the original Hebrew has been um, translated in different ways. There's a lot of scholarship and literature around this, and it's very interesting. But one of the other things that I found uh, really interesting about what I learned in my time at Union was about actually in the category of church history and colonialism and how that specific interpretation has been used by uh, just to take one point of the papal bulls from the Vatican in the 15th century uh, to say that the, the Christian Europeans that were coming to the Americas and Africa had the right to conquer, vanquish, and subdue all non-Christian, uh, all, all of the native people of those lands who were part of the flora and fauna. So that interpretation of Genesis through the papal bulls looking at the people in Africa and the Americas and saying, this is what that means, to me gave a kind of aha moment of, oh, well, that makes the world as it looks and is shaped today. And the connections that you know we hear from native people who are on the front lines of resisting fossil fuel infrastructure all over the world have been saying, make so much sense. So I, I believe that you all here in Virginia in this time talking directly to Dominion about the core values of what we stand for uh, as a people um, and also just as humans who are recognizing our interconnectivity with the natural world and protecting because of course climate change doesn't care about the border between North Carolina and Virginia um, and it doesn't care about um, about the border between Canada and the US or Mexico for that matter so we're being taught lessons on really deep levels about who we are, where we are, uh, and, and these are, this is, a, as has been said so eloquently before me, a moral and spiritual time. Uh, moral and spiritual. Yeah. The other root cause I want to mention um, is the economic development paradigm of short-term monetary gain, 
no matter how inequitable, no matter the pollution, and no matter the depletion of resources. And uh, as the, we know that one of the main ways people measure economic growth is GDP, and those are the things that it, it's, there's a sort of you know, well-known critique of GDP, so I hope I'm not boring you with it, but I always find it continually relevant, because when you look at the news and you look at the way our political discourse is, it's still based around economic growth as if this is the indicator of a successful society. And GDP does not count, as I said, inequality. It doesn't, and we, we know that so well now in this country um, in terms of, of, of seeing that go up and then people are struggling and so much of it is hoarded in this, in this tiny sector. So it doesn't count inequality, it doesn't count depletion of resources, it doesn't count pollution, and it doesn't count something that uh, it positive investment in other things. So uh, if you're going to invest in something like protecting a beautiful forest for future generation, that's only a cost. It's not counted as a benefit. There's so many opportunity costs in this uh, in this current paradigm. So um, the rights of corporations have gotten completely out of control under this paradigm. Um, corporations. <laughs> the costs are the costs. All of that is in incredible costs, particularly from the pollution. And as we've heard tonight, it's, it's, there, are two, there are two levels of it. Of course, we already have climate impacts coming. So uh, the most vulnerable and poorest people in the world are suffering from the stronger storms and the droughts and the heat waves and the wildfires and the rising sea levels. And that's true around the planet, and we are all connected. And I, I love that beautiful quotation about the uh, inescapable network of mutuality and the garment of destiny. Um, but also from the extractionist industries themselves when they are polluting. And we saw also that very compelling graphic about where these compressor stations are. So it's not a mystery. It's very, very clear. It's racism. Yes. And we're not going to put up with it. And all of the delegates of Virginia to know that we all stand with Union Hill. Yes. yes. And we all stand with Union Hill. And we thank them. We are all connected. And we're going to change this system. There is um, one of the things about looking into this in interfaith dialogue at Union is. Uh, is and looking at different belief systems in, in different um, religions, you start to realize also that the world, as, as it's presented to us as sort of secular or neutral, is kind of anything but. <laughs> it's highly charged with a value system. And um, as I mentioned, this, economic, this idea of economic growth is part of it. Reverend Barber has called it a cultic commitment to greed. Mm -hmm. And when you watch our discourse in our in our, in our mainstream entertainment, in our news programs, in the way people talk and think about worth and wealth and success, it is starting, I think more and more of us are starting to see through that, right? These are not the things we value most. Um, the things that we value most are, are shared, not only in community, but with future generations. And this system is designed to eat them alive, and we're not going to take it anymore. So I want to say um, also just within that, so all wealth is, is, is derived from the biosphere, and in some ways, you know, people point to the fact that even within this system that doesn't measure things correctly, that this is going to crash. That, um, I don't know if folks saw that, that New York Times article by Bethany McLean on September 1st that was about the, um, basically about the bubble of fracking. Um, and uh, this is something that many people have been saying for a while that seems to be breaking through to a kind of mainstream economic analysis. We saw this with subprime mortgages. These fossil fuels, there are, in order for us to avoid catastrophic climate change, 85% of known fossil fuels must remain in the ground. Yeah. So, we can't, 
the other 15%, we've, we've got to be smart. We're reasonable. We understand that we have to draw that down in a way that doesn't cut people off. And we have justice concerns about uh, the, the, what people need in order to meet their energy needs. But we cannot be continuing on this trajectory and searching for more. So the point that this article was making is that as we've seen in these other patterns like subprime mor mortgages, it will come to what is the final word of the piece, I think, a bitter end. So it's just a question of how much damage we let them do to our shared land, air, and water, and all the other living species and beings that we share this with. And it is absolutely obscene that we would have a discourse around this that does not deal with that. So. I really think I really think that that you're going to win. That this is we know that you're on the right side of history. I want to say one word about um, the pipeline uh, struggles that I've been a part of in other states, just to give some context. Um, in New York, with the Constitution pipeline. So a word on 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 fracked gas, which I know you all already know, but just for the record, I do think that this is a huge part of what we're dealing with that there has been this misinformation campaign, even the huge misinformation campaign of the whole fossil fuel industry, there's been a subset of misinformation about fracked gas, about so-called natural gas and methane that really needs to be clear, cl cleared up. And uh, you know, I just got an ad on my, on my computer from the American Petroleum, Petroleum Institute about how clean natural gas is. And it's, it's really, um, an Orwellian and dangerous situation when uh, corporations can do this, spread this amount of misinformation and, and lies at the expense of us actually being able to protect something for future generations and all of life. So I, I want to say also though that I think that there were many people who were honestly confused by it for some time and there was a lot of information, it was a bridge fuel, people felt like we had to get off coal. So just an invitation to any politicians out there um, who wanted, who were pro-pipeline and who, who were pro-natural gas and didn't see a problem with it, I think all of us can say that all is forgiven if you come now to this side. <laughs> mistakes and that's one other thing that we're dealing with now do our first works over it's okay move on um, yeah um, and and then you're, you're stronger everyone knows individuals in their lives who are stronger when they've looked at a mistake and I do think that we've all been there and that we're there as a country right now so I just want to say about Constitution the aim pipeline was that was the one um, that when I was in, in Boston and West Roxbury that I was part of a civil disobedience action and um, and really have a lot of respect for the people that uh, that do that in a spiritual way with the power of nonviolence and the public witness of unmasking the violence that is going on towards the earth. And the other part of that action I just want to mention um, is that every elected official in that uh, neighborhood was against that pipeline. Um, the city of Boston was suing against that pipeline. This, like many other cases, is a case of corporate rights over community rights. Yeah. And, and, and the system has become one of bribery, essentially. And it's so entrenched that it really does take disruption yes. to, to unmask it. Because uh, I've been in these situations and protested in front of FERC um, with people, you know, the microphone, and everybody's going about their daily lives, you know, and 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 I remember at one point hearing my friends say, you know, it seems like we're the ones who are crazy. I know, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, what's crazy is acting like nothing's wrong, yeah. Yeah. and that yeah. is true. So we have to be in this uncomfortable space right now, where some people look at us like like we're the fringe people, but in fact, it is insanity that is governing this system of That's fossil right. fuel extraction. So, um, I, I also was very, was very much inspired by Standing Rock. I'm so glad that someone sang that beautiful song and, uh, and shared that, um, that feeling 
again about what, what happened at Standing Rock. Um, I do think that the leadership from First Nations is really important here, and I want to acknowledge the people from Original Peoples First Nations uh, who have been a part of that. Here, um, I was really happy to hear from the Lumbee in North Carolina, and um, I, I was looking at, at this document that they had um, prepared, uh, which was a report about um, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, and there's a quote saying, some of the most precious things were not bought and paid for with money. Mm -hmm. And going on to saying uh, that we believe one hallmark of Lumbee identity is concern for the well-being of the environment now and in the future. And a people that makes that a hallmark of their identity, I think that is who we can all be as an American people. It's high time we learn from Native peoples yes. here in this country. campaign event. Uh, thank you so much to Delia Rasul for coming down there and for representing Virginia in that way and for pulling that together. It was a wonderful event and I think the beginning of many more such cross currents. Uh, the Poor People's Campaign was organized by folks at Union Theological Seminary, one of my dear friends, Reverend Liz Theo Harris. Yes. Were you with her earlier? Yes, she texted yes. me. <laughs> she said, I just met a Swami from Yoga. <laughs> <laughs> I sent her the article from oh, the Washington Post. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, so anyway, they are very, very interested in working more on that. And by the way, I just want to quote one thing from that article because I thought this was so interesting. The Federal Re Regulatory um, Energy Regulatory Commission's 800-page environmental impact statement makes one mention of the compressor station's impact on Union Hill's history of African-American settlement after the Civil War. But it says this is no problem because the pipeline's builders found that the area, quote, does not exhibit a cohesive cultural landscape. Oh. So these are, these, this is the kind of, when I'm talking about the papal bulls and dominion, and then I read that, it really feels like it's still happening. A cohesive cultural landscape is defined by who? Dominion energy? Yeah. <laughs> because we are a people who have been in relation with land, with water, with trees. There's a biocultural heritage in this country that is precious and deeply valuable. And they want to take it away to make money. It's really something. So I wanted to just quote that because I believe that we're fighting for our, for our culture, for our values. I know we're at a turning point. I want to just say that to oppose these pipelines is to stand up for nature, to say no to Mountain Valley Pipeline and Atlantic Coast Pipeline is to honor and cherish future generations, to resist this systemic assault on our air and our water and our soil is to be for a vision of shared wealth in a world that works for all. It's to be for jobs and renewable energy. It's to be for justice. And it's to be for the United States of America that we know that we can all be together. And I know, did I do a good enough job? My yeah. first <laughs>